Good morning. Real quick, if if you are a child and would like to participate in the procession of the palms, we invite you to go back towards the lobby by the family room. Uh, and anybody else that would like to be a part of the procession, raise your hand if your wife tells you that you're immature. You're welcome to go back Yay! there in the procession. Uh, make sure you have a palm with you. Um, if you play the drums, you can go back there and be part of the recession. <laughs> but uh, it'll be fun. They'll just walk around with the palms uh, to celebrate. Palm Sunday, which Jesus comes into Jerusalem and celebrate him as king. All right. Let's all stand up together. To the King of glory and light, all praises. To the only giver of life. are open wide. We worship you. Come see what love has done. Amazing. He bought us with his blood. Our Savior. The cross is overcome. We worship you. Oh, 
Hey, let's stand up together. Saves us 
is to take all of those items with them when they leave. One of the main things that we provide for families experiencing homelessness is a home. A home where they can cook a home-cooked meal on their own oven and put things in their own refrigerator. A table where they can sit and have dinner as a family. Safe beds and bedrooms where they can go and close the door and close out the world and all of their problems. And even a shower where they can have a nice hot shower and enjoy their home. And in Rainbow Village, we actually expanded our services not long ago to include cable and internet. And if we've learned anything over the last few years, we know that there's no way to exist without those items. So our children are able to get digital learning done. The parents are able to work from home. The parents are also able to do job searches. We want to make sure that they don't have to deal with any other issues other than those that they need to become self-sufficient. Every day, everything that we do is about helping the families that live at Rainbow Village. We can serve 30 families at a time, but you and I both know that there are more than 30 families that need our help. So we need your help, your donations, your opportunities to volunteer, your time, talent, and your treasure are all needed to support the families of Rainbow Village. Because we know that there's no place like home and it truly takes a Rainbow Village. Rainbow Village is a um, great organization that helps families experiencing homelessness in our community. If you'd like more information on how you can help serve, um, they'll be in the back after the service. Um, there are many ways you can give. You can give online. Um, you can set up a recurring um, online payment. Um, there are baskets in the back um, that you can drop off a, a, your tithe in person, or you can mail it to the church. Um, as we start entering our time of prayer, uh, we also recognize that there are many joys and concerns in our community. Um, and so we want to lift up the joys on this triumphant day, but we also want to be with those who are experiencing some hardships in this time as well. Um, so there are names on the screen. So as we pray, um, keep keep those on your heart. Let us pray. Glorious and gracious God, we thank you so much for this day and for your triumphant entry into Jerusalem. God, we, we know that not everything is triumphant, Lord, so would you please be with us um, as we experience just this life, and may we remember that in our hardships you are still triumphant. Lord, we ask that you bless our offerings as well. May our um, gifts and our tithes our services and everything that we give, give back to you and be done in your name for your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's stand up together. The word of God says where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. to the praises of his people.
have your way in our hearts. Take your place in the center of our lives, Father. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. My name's Alex. I'm an associate pastor here, and I preach the uh, 930 service. And we're having Palm Sunday this morning. If you couldn't tell by the palms, you should have gotten your palms. If you just got here, we had a big procession where everybody was waving their palms. And this morning's also what we call our intergenerational Sunday. We usually do it the first Sunday of the month, but since there was a lot of fun things for kids going on, we wanted to, uh, um, we wanted to do it this week instead. And so... Uh, one thing I did was to keep kids entertained during the sermon, or anybody who just needs to be entertained, I made bingo cards out of my sermon. So if you want a bingo card so that you can win a, a pack of Skittles by filling out bingo, by paying attention to the sermon, do the bingo card. Right here is the word burrito. It's in my sermon. You'll find out later. Um, all right, so we are going to begin... Give me one second. Abigail is going to come read our scripture this morning. Everybody give Abigail a hand. But first, I need to find her a microphone. Can I borrow a toilet? Oh, you got hers. Oh, there we go. All right, so if you open your Bibles up to John 12, verses 12 through 16, it'll be up on the screen as well. Jesus enters Jerusalem. The next day, the great crowd had come for the festival or heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. They shouted, Hosanna! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the King of Israel. Jesus found a don young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Don't be afraid, daughter of Zion. Um, look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand these things at first. After he was, glor after he was glorified, they remembered that, that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Word of God for the people of God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Watch your step. <laughs> There we go. Uh, that's our Palm Sunday passage. We call it Palm Sunday because this is Jesus coming into, the Jerus coming into Jerusalem for the last time before the cross and resurrection. And they're celebrating him as king and they're throwing palm branches down. And in the Matthew version, other versions, they're throwing coats down in front of him. All of it symbolizes that Jesus is king. They're, they're claiming him as king. Um, before I explain more about that, I want to explain this. About 17 years ago, in the summer of 2005... I was 17 years ago. It kind of freaks me out. Um, I was a camp counselor at Camp Listen. And my buddy and I, uh, we created a new game we called Battle Ball. And what Battle Ball was is it was a combination of dodgeball and capture the flag. All right, so we started in the gym. And what we did was well, we're like, all right, so the idea is you have a ball, and you're going to run around with the ball, and you're going to try to capture the flag. If somebody hits you with the ball while you're trying to capture the flag, you're out. But if they're on your side of the court, you can tag them, just like in regular capture the flag. But if you're 
on their side of the court. You're trying not to get tagged. You've got that ball, and you can get them out even on their side of the court. Does that make sense? All right. So that was the basic iteration was they were throwing dodgeballs at each other while also trying to capture the flag. But then we're like, what if we had obstacles, you know, like things to hide behind? And so we got some tables and we laid them down, and so now they had like, you know, uh, stuff they could dive behind and pop up and hit each other and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so they were like, we need to be even more epic. So we, we started with like 12 kids, and we ended up with like 40 kids, and we took these 40 kids out to what they call the back 40 at Camp Glisten. Uh, and basically, it's a huge field with a road in the middle, which is perfect because the road was the line. And the rest of it was the field, so they put the catch the flag. And so instead of dodgeballs at this point in this huge field, we gave them all hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of water balloons. And so now, uh, so now the kids are chasing each other across this huge field, trying to capture the flag, hitting each other with water balloons. But that wasn't enough because the counselors weren't playing. We were just standing in the middle, you know, uh, it's making sure that people who got out went out. And we're like, but what if we were the artillery? So we got a couple of water balloon launchers, uh, slingshots. And so we're just sitting there aiming them at unsuspecting kids while they're trying to play this game and shooting them with water balloons. All right, so I bring all this up because what happens was everybody would get out like you would in dodgeball or capture the flag. But we had a timer set, which meant that you had to be quick about capturing the flag because even if you got a whole bunch of people out, They'd come back in, and I think maybe like three minutes or something like that. And so that was the game changer, was this release of captives, the idea that, you know, you could be the only person left on your team, but if you could just hold out for that three minutes, the rest of your team would come back in. So there's my tie-in to Palm Sunday. This is what Israel at the time is waiting for, a great reversal, a release of captives, a shift in the battle that they were facing. So to understand how they're responding to Jesus coming into Jerusalem. We've got to understand kind of the Old Testament passages, the prophecies that they're thinking about in their heads, the hope that they're waiting. Because they're sitting there, you know, they've they've got their own country, sort of, but Rome's in control, and they're not really getting to pick who their leaders are. And There's all sorts of oppression, and they don't have the presence of God in the temple like they used to, and they don't have the glory of the temple. It's not what they thought they were supposed to have, so they're waiting. And they've got passages like this. So they see a leader come in, on a donkey, and they immediately think of Zechariah 9, 9 through 12. Let's take a look at that. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Sing aloud, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king will come to you. He is righteous and victorious. He is humble and riding on an ass, on a colt, the offspring of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. The bow used in battle will be cut off. He will speak peace to the nations. His rule will stretch from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. Moreover, by the blood of your covenant, I will release your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, prisoners of hope. Moreover, declare today that I will return double to you. So in that, you see him riding on a donkey. This king is coming in, but he's coming in with peace. He's going to make a rule of the whole world, and he's going to release captives. So that's what they're thinking. That's what they're Celebrating, And then uh, you've also got Isaiah 62, 10 through 12. It says this. Pass through, pass through the gates. So Jesus is coming in Jerusalem. Prepare the way for the people. Build, build the road. Clear away the stones. Raise up a signal for the peoples. This is what the Lord announced to the earth's distant regions. Say to daughter Zion, look, your deliverer arrives, bringing reward and payment. They will be called the holy people, redeemed by the Lord. And you will be called sought after, a city that is not abandoned. That daughter Zion, Zion's a word for Jerusalem, in case you were wondering about that. And they're just talking about the city as a daughter of God. Um, But in that, they're waiting for the king to show up so they can be not abandoned, so that they can be a people again. These are the hopes that they're waiting for, that they're feeling like, you know, we're sort of the Jewish people, but we don't really have our own autonomy. And we don't really have the centrality of the presence of God, and we feel abandoned. And so they're sitting there with these passages in their mind, and they, and they grew up waiting for this hope. And so they see Jesus come in, they, and they quote Psalm 118 and say, you know, God save us. That Hosanna means God save us. It's like a celebration word, but it's also a pleading, asking God to rescue us word. And so bless this Jesus from Psalm 18, which I don't know if this was a coincidence when they put the Bible together uh, in its current form, maybe around 400, 500 A.D., 
they, and then in the Middle Ages, they gave them chapters, but Psalm 118 is the actual center of the Bible by chapter. Uh, and Psalm, 19, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter. And Psalm 118 is the middle of the Bible. And I don't know how they worked that out, if that was intentional or not. But right there in the very middle of the Bible, we have this passage that says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because that's the hope that we're waiting for. And so they're waiting for three things. Oh, that's it. I got the bingo card out. We already talked about dodgeball. There was a donkey and a daughter. I know it's a weird thing to say because they were in Egypt. Now, in Egypt, they were in their own land. They, they, they were slaves. They were working for Pharaoh. But they haven't exactly been free since. They were free for just a little bit. So they escape from Egypt, you know, in the Old Testament, and they become their own kingdom. But then they don't follow God's laws, and they start getting taken over by empire after empire. It starts with the Assyrians. And after the Assyrians, the Babylonians took them over. And after the Babylonians, the Persians took over. And the Persians were kind of like, the, if you're going to get ruled by a dictator, the Persians were the best, from what I could tell. They were like, oh, yeah, 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 go back, build your temple, go back. You know, they, in fact, the book of Isaiah even calls Cyrus, the Persian leader, uh, a Messiah figure because he rescued them from Babylon. Now, if you get into real Persian history, they were still pretty rough people. But as far as they go, you know, if you had to pick from the five empires that they were taken over in succession— the Persians were probably the best. Somebody who knows more about history might come at me with, about that. But the Persians were letting them rebuild. What, but then, after the Persians, that Alexander the Great guy came, and he took over. And then, then there was kind of this, this weird empire where Alexander the Great's kingdom split into four different pieces, and one of those four pieces took over uh, Israel. And then, along comes the Romans. So they have spent from probably about 700 B.C. to Jesus' time being oppressed by one empire or another. Y'all see that? So they wanted freedom. They wanted a new Moses, someone who was going to deliver them from this oppression that they were facing. That's why the book of Matthew, if you read through it and think about it, it points out a lot about how Jesus is like Moses. I mean, he, he runs off to Egypt, and he comes back, and he, you know, he's almost killed as a child, just like Moses was. Um, all the symbolism is supposed to make them think this is Moses. But along the lines, they're, they're thinking the history of Egypt and, and this need for freedom, but they're also wanting a return from exile. That's the second thing they're hoping for, because exile was different. So exile was when they got removed from their land. But at the same time, exile was a loss of the presence of God. So they got their land back, in a sense. They're living in Israel. But the presence of God, yeah, is a good one? Presence was in there? Oh, Kim, oh, bingo. All right, on your way out, you don't have to do it right now, but on your way out, we've got Skittles back there. Why don't you see if you can get blackout? That's where you get the whole card. Because all of that should be in my sermon at some point. Um, is it for free? I, don't, oh, I said it. There it is. Um, <laughs> anyway, so exile, they had the land back, but they didn't have the presence of God. So when the Romans finally conquered Israel, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the general that took over Israel was a guy named Pompey, and he was right before Julius Caesar, and so like 70 B.C.-ish, he, uh, he goes into Israel, and he's... he's trying to act reverent, but he was like, I've heard great things about your temple, that there's something really special in this holy of holy places. And they had, if you, you read like some of the, the stuff that was being written about Israel, but not by Israel, they were all trying to guess what was in there. They were like, well, maybe there's like a flying cow in there, or maybe there's like, you know, maybe they've got some Greek slave that they're making give oracles, or this hell is crazy stuff. And so Pompey goes to the holy of holies, which he shouldn't have done, but he thought he was being polite, but he wasn't. And he pulls back the curtain, and there was nothing there. The Ark of the Covenant had been lost hundreds of years before. There was nothing in this Holy of Holies. And it just symbolized the fact that the presence of God, this holiest space on earth where heaven was supposed to meet earth, was empty, and they were waiting for the presence of God to come. And so Pompey was like, you know, they, they've been celebrating this, this space. There's nothing there, like what they're they say. The third thing they wanted, as we saw in the Isaiah passage, was they wanted a role as God's people. 
you guys know that the story of the Old Testament is basically Israel becomes the chosen people of God. They are God's people. They're going to show God to the world. They're going to show what it looks like when a community lives in relation to God when they follow God's laws. They would be what, uh, what God wanted was for them to be a holy priesthood. A priest is somebody who connects heaven to earth, somebody who does who talks to heaven on behalf of the people, maybe offering sacrifices, but also tells the people what God might be saying. It's that connection of heaven and earth. And we've always had, like, some people serving as priests, but the real goal for Israel and for the people of God and for us is for everybody to be a place where heaven meets earth, we, where you are praying on behalf of your brothers and sisters and on behalf of the world, and you are talking to the world about what God says, not just a pastor, not just individual special people, but each one of us is called to be a priest for the world. But that's what they're waiting for. But they're thinking about it more in the terms of they're the chosen people of Israel. So that's who they hope Jesus is. That's why it was really confusing for them when he didn't do the things they were looking for. So they turn on him in a few days. You know, this is the beginning of Holy Week. We know by Friday that most of the people wanted him to be crucified. He didn't do what they were expecting. They thought he was going to go into Jerusalem and kick out the Romans. They thought that he, they, he was going to restore proper temple practices, that he was going to restore the presence of God, and that they were going to have this glorious new kingdom like they had with David and with Solomon. And he didn't challenge Rome at all. And he has these conflicts with the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, in a lot of their eyes, were the people that should have been his allies. They're the ones who said, you know, we see the problem is we don't have God, and the reason we don't have God is because nobody's following his law, so let's all follow his law. And so, and then we can return the presence of God and get rid of all the, the outside influence that leads to idolatry, and it all sounds good on paper, but Jesus always had conflicts with them. And the reason is, is that their vision for what God was going to do was too small. And sometimes we're like that too. What we expect God to do is just too small. And when it's too small, and we see what God is really trying to do, then it makes us push back. We say, I don't know if I really want that. Kind of like Jonah saying, you know, you told me to go tell the Assyrians, who were probably the worst empire that they were taken over with, the craziest at least. He's like, he's supposed to go tell the Assyrians that they could repent and be the people of God. And Jonah was like, I don't want to go to them. They're awful. I really want you just to destroy, can you just destroy them? That would be so much better. And like even after he preaches his sermon, finally after running away and coming back, he goes and sits on a hill waiting expectantly to see God, you know, destroy the city. And, and God doesn't because they repent. He didn't want them to be a part of that. His, his vision was too small. And so when you mix all sorts of like nationalism and, and uh, this is our people, we want good things for our people and bad things for other people, you end up like the people today. And so... N.T. Wright, who's an amazing New Testament scholar, um, uh, his, his name does not mean New Testament, um, they call him Tom, the T stands for Tom, but uh, he has this great analogy that probably won't push any buttons unless you're Scottish, but basically you guys know that Scotland always wants their independence from England, that's a common thing, they vote, they have a referendum, they want their opinion. Now imagine somebody in Scotland shows up and says, hey, I want to lead this Scottish revolution, but there's not going to be any kilts. There's not going to be any bagpipes. That's on the sheet. Um, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to use the flag. We don't need the Scottish flag. Um, in fact, I got an idea. How about Scotland's for everyone? Everyone can be Scottish. Even the British, they can be Scottish too. And that's basically what Jesus was saying to the Israelites. He's saying, I, I know you've got these distinctives and you want to have this nation state, but what if instead it was a kingdom for everybody? And they weren't all about that. Jesus preached a new kingdom, but everyone was invited. They should have seen it coming because it was in Scripture. God calls Abraham to leave his people. He says, you're going to be a blessing to all nations. That whatever Israel was to become, it wasn't so they could be set apart and everybody else to be judged. Israel was supposed to exist so they could be a light to the rest of the world to invite everybody in to know God. I mean, Isaiah says it over and over in the prophecies that they're thinking about when they're waiting for a Messiah. He's saying all people are going to come to the temple. All people are going to understand the presence of God. God's going to have peace across the whole earth, not just for Israel. But they wanted it just to be for them because they were tired of being oppressed. So that's kind of a test for us with what we want to see happen in our world. Think about whatever you think is wrong with this world. 
And now think about, don't say it out loud, and, you know, Kim, don't point any fingers, but who's responsible for all the problems? <laughs> Good job, you didn't point it out. Um, <laughs> who's responsible for all the problems? Now imagine that being fixed, and you've got the community that you want. The people that were responsible for the problems, are they invited to be a part of that community? That's the test that the vision we have for what this world should look like is Jesus' vision. That if you think there's injustice or oppression, and you think some people are taking power and using it wrongly, if your version of how the world works perfectly involves those people also experiencing the joy of community, that's how we have the big picture of Jesus. And it doesn't sit well a lot of times because we're like, but we want justice, and justice means punishment for those people. That's what Jonah was mad about. That's what the people were mad about. That's why Jesus' vision is so much bigger. They couldn't stomach that, so they turn on him. They call for the power that they wanted freedom from. They, they asked Rome, remember they want freedom from Rome, to kill the one who would be their Messiah. And that's what happens when we don't have a big enough vision. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll capitulate to some kind of use of power to deal with the other use of power that we don't like, and we end up like Pompey. Like I said, this emperor came in, he took everything over. He was king of the world. He was the best general in Rome. He didn't make it like 20 years before Julius Caesar killed him, and then we all know what happened to Julius Caesar and the Roman Empire and everything. You can't live like that. If you take power like that, if you expect power to work like that, it will turn on you. That's why maybe we should look into this bigger vision where we do forgive and we do invite all people. And so here's the, that's, that's the, the sad irony. So the power we try to wield coercively ends up turning on us. But the beautiful irony about Jesus going to the cross is that he intended for that to happen. They wanted to deal with Jesus, but he wanted it to happen. The cross was the battle for him to actually become king. Palm Sunday is about them calling him king, but not really understanding. The cross and the resurrection are about him actually becoming king. The cross was the battle. He defeats Satan on the cross the resurrection was the outcome. The resurrection was the declaration. We won the battle. The ascension is him taking his throne. This is all about Jesus becoming king. And so let's talk a little bit about what the cross does and how it leads to the things that they were hoping for. Number one, the cross redeems from slavery. They were enslaved. They were enslaved politically, but they also were enslaved in our hearts, just like each one of us. And so what Jesus did on the cross was, first of all, he rescued us from death. Because if we don't have to die, if we, we die and we rise again, we no longer have to fear death. That's a, that's a great hope to have. Amen? That changes everything. I mean, most power, coercive power, empires, tyrants, you know, dictators, whatever, their big power that they have over us is that they can kill us. And if they can't, or if we just come back and we're not scared of that, we can live in a freedom even in the midst of oppression. Number two, we have freedom from sin. Because it wasn't just the political powers that killed Jesus. There was a demonic force killing Jesus. Satan wanted Jesus dead. But what he didn't know was that by doing the worst thing possible to Jesus meant that when Jesus walks out of that grave, he has no more power. Like, what more could he possibly do then kill the Son of God. And so he says, I even have power over that. And so now we're free from evil. We're free from sin. He took the worst that the devil had to offer so we could be free. It's not what the people were expecting because it was a bigger freedom. Now, it's a freedom that can lead to political freedom. It's a freedom that can lead to community freedom, but it's also a freedom from the brokenness in us. That's a big freedom. So if we accept Jesus' actions for ourselves what Jesus did on the cross, and we say, I want that for me. We have that freedom. Freedom to no longer fear what the world could do to us. Freedom to no longer be bound by our own brokenness. Now, it's not something that happens overnight. You know, each one of us is bound by our habits and by, you know, our thought patterns, and we have to work that out with God to be transformed, to really experience that freedom, but now it's a choice, where it used to be, I'm going to make this bad decision, and I can't help it, to I can work with God to move into a new life, but can be a sanctified person. I can live into the life that Jesus has for me. Now, I do want to say this, that I could, it could sound like I'm saying we don't need to worry about justice in this world. 
It could sound like I'm saying, well, we have freedom in our hearts, so it doesn't matter, you know, what our boss does to us or what politics do to us. But that's not what I'm saying. We still work for justice. And I say this all the time when I talk about the end times. Whatever we think the next world's going to look for, look like, whatever, you, whatever justice, peace, whatever in the next world, that's what we work for now. But we can have a peace in the midst of the frustration that the world takes longer to fix than we thought it would and the setbacks because we know that the next world is going to be perfect. Second thing is that we have a return for, of the presence. Remember I said they wanted freedom, but they also wanted a return from exile. So we have a return of the presence of God. Again, it's not what they looked like. When an ancient Jew thought about the presence of God, they thought about the fire and the cloud in the Exodus story. They thought about the glory, the Shekinah glory sitting over the temple. They were looking for that. Instead, God himself as a man walked into their midst or rode on a donkey. Better yet, he offers his presence to us. When Jesus ascends, he sends the Holy Spirit. So now instead of a cloud or it's a Shekinah glory in the temple, the presence of God that was in the temple was in each one of us. But again, if somebody gives you something different than what you asked for, you get suspicious. You know, you go to a burger restaurant, they give you a chicken sandwich that you didn't order, you get suspicious. Chances are they messed up your order in that case, but here God was giving us something better, but we were suspicious. They wanted to change Israel. They wanted hope for Israel, but instead, Jesus changes the whole world. They wanted their land back, but instead, if, if the presence of God is inside of us, wherever we walk becomes holy ground presence of God returns to us, to comfort, to be with us in the midst of any situation, not whether or not we have land. So we go into this new life. We could say, Hosanna, God rescue us, and it could be a cry for help, but also a celebration. The last thing they were wanting for was to be the people of God. In Jesus, we become the people of God. Like I said, Israel was created not so they could be set apart from all the evil nations, but so that they could show all the evil nations what it looks like to follow God. And they thought it meant, oh, we were born into this. Some of them thought, we were born into this, so we're special no matter what. And so they stopped following the laws of God, and they ended up in exile. They ended up without the presence of God. So the Pharisees, they see the problem correctly. They say, well, the problem is you're not following God. The problem is, you know, we're not honoring God with our lives, so let's just try to do that. And so they start trying to follow all the rules of the Old Testament, but they miss it because Jesus shows us a better way. It's not about following rules to earn the presence of God. It's about being in love with God and loving our neighbor, which makes us want to follow rules that bring community and love of God. Does that make sense? We don't say, oh, well, I've got to do this, 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 and I earn it. It is, I love God. I want his world. I want his peace in this world. So I'm going to follow these rules because to not follow these rules is to break that. And we don't earn it. We don't mess up and we're just like, oh, we're out. We still have God's grace over us. And so what happens now is if we love God and we want to be the people of God who shows the world what it looks like for people to f become the people of God, to show the world what kind of life we can really have, we have to become like Jesus. That's what it's about. So what we see in Zechariah 9, 9, when he rides in on a donkey, this is going to be really funny to say what I'm about to say with the music behind me. But I don't know if you guys know this. I always think about this when I read this passage. I read scripture really weird. But he came in on a little donkey. In Spanish, donkey is burro, which means that little donkey in Spanish is burrito, with the rolling the R. So Jesus rode a burrito. He commandeered the burrito. Police go to Moe's and they say, give me that burrito. Same thing Jesus did with the music behind me. I love that that happened. That worked out perfectly. Anyway, he comes in on a donkey. He didn't come in on a war horse. He comes in humbly. That's what Zechariah says. And it says that he's going to do all this by the blood of the covenant. I don't know if Zechariah knew what he was saying, but that it was going to be his own blood. Jesus, his blood would be poured out for us to be the people of God. He was humble. He sacrificed. He loved and if we're to love Jesus, we become like Jesus. That's what we have to do. Because Jesus' kingdom of love topples empires. There's a lot of power in this world, but we see empire after empire after empire get taken over. And every time at the height of those empires, they say, we're kings of the world, nobody can touch us. And then it falls. Every time. I mean, it's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. 
Jesus shows us a different way where if we're humble, if we serve, even when we're defeated, even if we're killed like Jesus, even if we're mistreated, whatever it is, if we walk it out in love, there will be victory. Amen? They were right to declare Hosanna and to say he's the one who's coming in the name of the Lord. They thought he was a king, but the problem is he wasn't the king they thought. Each generation since then, including us, runs the risk of having the same problem where we, Jesus isn't the king we thought, so either we reject him or we make up stuff about him. We say, well, I really, I really think God's like this and God cares about this. And it usually just ends up whatever we think is most important instead of looking at scripture and saying, who is Jesus really? How does he feel? How does he interact with people who disagree with him? How does he interact with people that are different with him? How does he, how does he maintain a life of peace? How does he Sabbath rest? How does he feel about money? All these different things that Jesus has a way of life about. We figure out what that is and we go and do that. And it's going to look radical and different to the world around us in a way that might draw them in. So let's figure out who Jesus actually is and let it, let it transform us. That's what this life is about. We don't want to just like sing songs about God and learn about God. We want the things that we learn about to transform us so that we become like Christ so we can show Christ to the world. Amen? That's what it means to claim Jesus as king. Let's pray. Jesus, we want you to be our king. Lord, we don't want our own will, but we want your will to be done in this world, Lord. So I pray that we figure out what that is. We pray that we figure out what your character, your love, your peace, your patience, your joy, your kindness, your goodness, your self-control, Lord, to be our character so that that's what the world sees when they see us. So that when we say that Jesus is king, it's not like all the other kings that are trying to take everything over by force, but instead we're showing away, serving humbly, and inviting people into community and love and transformation. So let us be transformed so we can see this world be transformed. In your name. Amen. As we close this morning, I'll be over there uh, to pray. If you made bingo, you're welcome to go get a pack of Skittles uh, from, from Brooks right there. She's got all the Skittles. She didn't know that, but now she does. Um, but let's, uh, let's continue worshiping and celebrating Jesus as King.
Amen. Amen. Let our lives be like that, to, to sing the goodness of God with everything we do. I've got a couple of invitations to community for you. We've got our Monday Thursday, which is our celebration of the Last Supper. Uh, that's coming up on Thursday at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. And then Good Friday, which is our Remembrance of the Cross, is at 7 p.m. in the chapel on Friday. And then Easter, we've got 6.30 sunrise service out there in front of Heritage Hall on the corner on 78. Uh, we've got service in here at 9.30, service in the sanctuary at 11, and then our Spanish-speaking service in the chapel at 12.30. Um, so I hope to see y'all all there for that. Don't forget to, uh, if, you, if you're making an offering this morning, to put that in the baskets on the way out. But I want to say this. We are claiming that Jesus is king. When we say that Jesus is king, we're letting him have our whole lives, which means we are being spiritually formed to become the people that God wants us to be. Spiritual formation, the idea of being changed into what God wants for us, is a process that takes habits and commitment, and it takes community. Um, I, was, I was reading... It, the other day, we're, we're not technically evangelical. Methodists, we kind of sit with one foot in every camp. But 40% of people who call themselves evangelical go to church once a year or less. So when we think about people who are claiming Jesus, who are not being formed at all, even if we go to church every week, that's one hour a week. Think about whatever it is that we are taking in, whether it's media or books or the people that we spend time with us, they're forming us. Whatever that is, that's our formation. Our spiritual formation is whatever we're giving our time to. I say all this to invite you guys into deeper stuff. So we're here for church. We have life groups that you can be a part of. If you want to know about it, come talk to Adam back there. Show up for our services. Find ways to spend time on your own in scripture and in prayer. Let that form you so we can be the people the world needs us to be, that God wants us to be so we can show his light to the world. We have to be formed with a commitment and habits be who we're going to be. We've got to rewire our brains, as it says in Romans, that we want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That takes time. Any habit you've ever built took time to build. We want to make that muscle memory to cry out to God, to step out in love, uh, to offer kindness first. Those are things that we can build over time if we'll commit to that. So get with community, be with God alone, celebrate in worship, and let's do that. Let's announce that Jesus is king so we can see him rescue the world and use us to do that to build his kingdom all right go in peace you're dismissed